Greetings, everyone, and welcome to City Lights Live, the virtual extension of the City Lights events calendar. I'm your host, Peter Maravellas, and tonight, City Lights, in conjunction with Verso Books, is pleased to present, present Dominique Ruthier in conversation with Toby Haslett and Jason E. Smith, celebrating the publication of the book with and against the Situationist International in the Age of Automation by Dominique Ruthier, published by Verso Books. Before we begin, as is customary before each event, I'd like to acknowledge we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. I want to take this moment to offer our respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. With and against, the situation is international in the age of automation arrives at an appropriate moment, I feel, as we're all trying to wrap our minds around the possibilities and consequences of advancing technologies. Dominic Ruthier has performed a great service of revealing a lesser publicized aspect of the Situationist International, one of the most significant radical political movements of the last century. The theorist of this movement struggled to come to terms with the then emerging ideologies of cybernetics and automation. Through a close reading of Situationist pamphlets, documents, artworks, and objects that refract elements of a cybernetic hypothesis, Dominique Ruthier reveals the debates and considerations the situationists had around the belief that technological progress, computers, and automation make class struggle and the idea of revolution obsolete. With and against serves as a kind of intervention, allowing us to move beyond the usual cliches surrounding situationism and explore a more complex story about the key historical shifts in the composition, capital, work, labor, art, and the revolutionary theory during the 50s and 60s. Dominic Ruthier is an art theorist and postdoctoral researcher currently employed at the University of Southern Denmark. His writings have appeared in Rethinking Marxism, Nordic Journal of Aesthetics, Boundary 2 Online, and LA Review of Books, amongst others. Joining him tonight are Toby Haslett and Jason E. Smith, Toby Haslett is a critic and writer. He has written about art, film, and literature for N Plus One, The New Yorker, Art Forum, The Village Voice, amongst other publications. He makes his home in New York City. Jason E. Smith has written extensively on contemporary politics and political economy in journals that include Art Forum, The Brooklyn Braille, Commune, Critical Theory, and others. He makes his home in Los Angeles. So join us now in offering a warm welcome to Dominic Ruthier, Toby Haslett, and Jason E. Smith, Welcome to City Lights. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I mean, um, I think we um, decided that I would start with a little bit of a presentation of the book. And then um, Toby and Jason would um, sort of throw in some ideas and, and questions and comments. Um, but first off, uh, thanks, Peter and uh, City Lights for hosting this. I'm very um, grateful to have this opportunity to um, speak with two people that I very much admire, um, Jason Smith and Toby Haslett. Um, this is really exciting for me, even though it's it's in the middle of the night. Um, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, I prepared a little bit of a, a speech or a presentation that I'm going to um, to um, read for you, and then uh, we can move into a uh, conversation from there. So, <clears throat> um, by way of introduction, <clears throat> I want to begin with a few general comments about the book for those of you who may not have read it. Um, the book, as you know, is about the situation at International, or the SI, as we'll probably refer to it throughout which was an avant-garde movement that existed formally between 1957 and 1972. And people sometimes refer to this group as the last avant-garde. And I think this is accurate to say, insofar as the history of the avant-garde of the 20th century avant-garde, as I argue in the book, comes up against its own limits in this historical period, which I refer to as the age of automation. So a little bit of context um, might be useful here. When I started my research for this book around 2016, parts of the so-called left were obsessing about how automation and AI would change everything and how we needed to organize collectively to 
quote, seize the means of computation, unquote, to create a post-capitalist society that was fully automated. So <clears throat> my own intellectual formation was by way of insurrectionary anarchism and anti-authoritarian communism. So I was quickly frustrated with this idea of a fully automated society, sometimes also referred to as accelerationism. <clears throat> as someone with an interest in the revolutionary legacy of the European avant-garde, I was provoked by the shameless rehearsal and co-optation of the utopian language and gestures of the avant-garde for what was essentially a deeply technocratic and entirely reformist vision of the future. To my mind, the SI was the last coherent attempt to fulfill the avant-garde's utopian aspirations towards creating not just new forms of art, but a new social totality. At stake was the meaning and definition of life itself beyond mere survival. The ultimate goal for the SI was not just to have more free time with machines producing endless amounts of gadgets to consume in that free time, but to remake everyday life itself by negating consumer society and abolishing the value form of the commodity. The SI insisted, in other words, that there could be no revolution without changing everyday life and destroying bourgeois life forms, ideologies, hierarchies, habits, tastes, values, and prejudices. Obviously, this was an incredibly ambitious and at times megalomanic project, and the stakes were high. Everything the, the SI did and said was premised on the subversion of capitalism as an alienating, conceived as an alienating mode of production and way of life. Art, insofar as they accepted this term for their experiments at all, was to be was to be put wholeheartedly in the service of the revolution of everyday life. Naturally, the idea of art as instrumental to the revolution of everyday life entailed an overall negative attitude towards the bourgeois institution of art, which often expressed itself in refusal to participate in the contemporary art world spectacle. One example of this is when the Danish painter Aska Jom, who plays an important role in my book, received the Guggenheim International Award in 1964 and sent a telegram telling Guggenheim to, quote, go to hell with your money, unquote. <clears throat> Today, it's rare to see artists refuse complicity with the capitalist art institution as such. The best they can do is perhaps to pull out a flag in protest of general doom and wave it with one hand while accepting the cash price with the other. Clearly, <clears throat> the understanding of art's place in society has changed since the time of BSI. As Jason notes in his wonderful review of my book, quote, there's more of it than ever and no one would, and no one would propose its abolition. Art no longer seeks solace in its rival, the commodity, mirroring it inimically. It merges with it and mocks itself, unquote. So the fact that formal expression in the arts becomes increasingly indistinguishable from the value form of the commodity expresses on another level, the deeper en entrenchment of art in the globalized matrix of money and power. In that light, there may be objective reasons why some artists may not dare attempt even minimal gestures of protest. As we've seen recently, some of the most powerful contemporary art institutions in the US are not only complicit in the ongoing Israeli-led genocide in Palestine, but are also actively trying to silence and intimidate anyone who dares speak out. <clears throat> so one reason I think to return to the history of the situation as international today is to study an internationalist and anti-colonial language of artistic protest that we seem to have lost the ability to understand and more importantly, to speak. In writing this book, <clears throat> I asked myself how and why the unitary approach, uh, the unitary revolutionary perspective of the SI seems to have disappeared from the horizon. When, when and how did we come to accept the separation of art from politics as a given? And what were the historically specific circumstances that allowed for the post-war reemergence and eclipse of the avant-garde project? And last but not least, what are the lessons that we can draw from it? So <laughs> these were some of the overall questions that I was thinking about 
when I was writing this book, and I don't have um, any good answers, I think, but um, I was hoping that they might prompt um, some from some of its readers and from people smarter and uh, braver than me. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my um, my intro. So Toby, do you have a uh, response to that intro, or do you? Because I, I don't. I have a question that sort of relates to it, but it's not totally kind of a direct response. So um, I can ask that, but I can also, you know, defer to you. Um, wow. Deferring to me, and I'm smarter <laughs> and braver. I'm actually dumber and more cowardly, and nobody should defer to me. Uh, I feel completely fraudulent having this conversation with the likes of you two. But the advantage of that is that I have a properly introductory question that will maybe fulfill the formal function of transitioning into the kind of back and forth, which is, uh, Dominique, can you just explain a little bit more how the situation is related to what you refer to in the book as the cybernetic hypothesis. And there's another way of posing this question, which is that as you explain the key features of the cybernetic hypothesis, I mean, the kind of challenge to teleology, the emphasis on feedback loops, and even a certain commitment to the keyword autonomy somehow lies imminent to the main principles of what you call gauchisme with uh, autonomy, decentralization, um, and anti-authoritarianism, and, and, and a degree of flexibility being, I mean, not just principles, but proper virtues of what would come to be known as the ultra-left. Um, so I guess the weirdly broad, but perhaps instructive and helpful opening question is, what is the relation between the fabulously futuristic cybernetic future that did not come to pass of uh, perfectly flexible, adaptable cybernetic systems and the old slogan from each according to his ability to each according to his need? They're not reducible to each other. And yet so much of what this book uses the situationist to explore is the degree to which one can be seen as lying imminent or as an imminent critique of the other. So for people who haven't read the book, I think it might be appropriate to give a fuller kind of philosophical description of what you're getting at. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, and and you're right. I mean, the, the idea of a cybernetic hypothesis kind of structures my book, right? So um, I I kind of argue for a for a, for different responses in each chapter that sort of that to this idea of cybernetics. Um, and maybe I should just quickly um, um, for those who who may not know, quickly sort of give a little bit of uh, context for that term, the cybernetic hypothesis, which originates in the um, sort of French post situationist. Um, group, Tikkun, uh, or the Invisible Committee to some, um, this kind of milieu, uh, which published a pamphlet that was called The Cybernetic Hypothesis. I forget when it was published. Um, but in it, they kind of um, claim that, um, so for them, the term The Cybernetic Hypothesis becomes sort of a a term to describe this overarching development in in capitalism, right? From say um, uh, a traditional sort of um, uh, manufacturing um, uh, from manufacturing to more sort of uh, post Fordist uh, flexible um, modes of of production, right? So. Um, uh, and for them, that also changes sort of the political landscape. So they say that um, politics become becomes kind of superfluous, and that um, cybernetics is this theory of of, of social homeostasis, and um, that um, computers, the idea that computers could could kind of replace politicians and sort of come to um, run a self governed society, right? Um, so that's kind of like their thesis, and uh, I pick up this term uh, in the book more, more to sort of um, use it as a, as a kind of um, heuristic uh, for structuring uh, my um, my narrative. So I I kind of um, start 
uh, out by saying that um, cybernetic plays uh, an important, if um, almost invisible role to begin with, it's as sort of something that they're gesturing towards a set of um, scientific philosophical uh, assumptions about um, technology and the, the possibilities of, of, of new um, technologies. And um, then um, in the second chapter, I, um, I show how, how this comes to comes to the fore and how they're really excited about um, the possibilities that this um, moment is opening up to. Um, and then as I argue, there's, there's a kind of evolution towards a more negative stance, a more critical sort of take on technology and a, a, a refusal of some of the earlier uh, sentiments of, of optimism. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the narrative, but um, it, it also kind of serves as a, uh, I mean, I guess one way, to, <laughs> I think one way to sort of uh, describe what I'm trying to do is you could say it's kind of like a Marxist reinterpretation of this kind of a little bit um, enigmatic idea of the cybernetic hy hypothesis, right? So I'm trying to ground it in the actual um, um, circumstances of, of the post-war moment, the political, economic, and the scientific uh, sort of developments that were, were happening in these uh, couple of decades. So yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I was just, I was very sort of inspired by this idea uh, early on and read a lot of the the Invisible Committee and Tikkun and all these things, and they've, they've been really important for my um, thinking. So I want to also acknowledge that while also sort of departing from it and saying that I think it leads to um, to analyses that are kind of untenable and uh, uh, borderline um, uh, problematic. Yeah. Is that does oh does that the uh, the other part of your question maybe I should I should briefly sort of um touch on the to which extent um, the cybernetic hypothesis correlates with with some of the um, French ultra left ideas about self government, autonomy, and decentralized organizations among sort of workers' councils, um, I think the uh, the way that I, I I describe it in the book is that that um, this was a rediscovery for the situationists of a line of thinking that harkens back to the 1920s, the Dutch and German sort of council communists. Uh, so it's not per se, like a new idea, but I do think that it gets a new inflection at this point and that it's sort of valorized um, in light of uh, cybernetic thinking, right? So um, so definitely, as you also said, like a lot of these ideas and concepts of autonomy, self-regulation, self-management um, uh, really sort of play into the same kind of um, social imaginary that, that, that cybernetics also catered to. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, maybe I'll ask a, a sort of follow-up question, um, kind of a clarification question. I should say, though, that one of my favorite terms that sort of um, expresses or corresponds to this idea of a kind of post-political, cybernetic kind of social self-regulation is algorithmic governance. This is like really like a, a kind of very loaded, symptomatic term, which is, you know, contemporary in the kind of worst way. Um, but it does actually bring up the sort of larger terminological um, sort of sort of um, fog around these terms cybernetic and and also automation, which of course is in the the title. And um, you know, like I, I, as you know, like in the in the late '40s and the '50s, there was a lot of kind of like searching around for the right terminology to describe these processes, whatever they may be. Um, so that you would have terms, for example, in the, in the kind of industrial context, like control engineering was a term that was used instead of automation, or maybe had slightly different implications. Uh, and the term control there is very important for lots of reasons. Um, but there's generally, to me anyway, there's this kind of distinction between automation, as we usually use it, which is, which sort of evokes the kind, a kind of a pro productive context, right? A kind of uh, dealing with productivity of labor, 
uh, wages, unemployment, class composition, things like that, right? And it's this kind of thing that introduces uh, these kinds of mutations within all those terms. Um, and then there's cyber, the kind of cybernetic, um, which has this kind of much broader sort of application, right? Because it's oftentimes used in the context of economics, let's say on the one hand, like in Pollock's book, Friedrich Pollock's book, which you cite, but also, you know, biology and basically any kind of self-regulating system is sort of characterized in, in those terms. And so I wanted to know if you had any sort of sense of um, or had a kind of sense of where those two terms apply in the context of your book, since um, in some sense, it seems that the, the term um, that's sort of most important for the SI in its early phase is automation, right? And these kind of debates around automation in the late mid to late fifties in France and elsewhere. But then it seems like there's a kind of, um, it seems like the term cybernetics or the cybernetic sort of becomes more and more important in the late sixties. And I, I wondered if you had some thoughts on whether that's, whether that's an actual <laughs> change that's taking place in their, um, and their conception of what the object is, you know, of the critique, um, and what the meaning of that might be. I don't know if yeah, I asked a question. I'm just giving you a long kind of commentary oh, on terminology. I mean, but... uh, that is true, and I think that um, definitely from around the sort of early to mid '60s, this this term really sort of comes into focus in the writings, uh, and this is also where they have this kind of back and forth with someone like Abraham Moll, which right. was one of the leading French cyberneticians that they uh, poured abuse on, uh, on, on on several occasions. And um, also some of their confrontations with, with some other post-war artists like Nicolas Schiffer, uh, who, who's, who was one of the makers of this uh, cybernetic automaton uh, or ro robot. Um, so yeah, it, it the terms, I mean, I think that um, both terms are sort of interchangeably used by the SI. Yeah. Sort of the, the, but it's true that, that cybernetics really comes into focus. And I think it also for a particular reason. Uh, and I think they actually come close to um, a reading, especially someone like Raoul Van Egen comes close to a reading that. Um, very much sort of um, uh, anticipates, is that the word? Um, anticipates the analysis uh, in Tikkun later on, right. where, where cybernetics is also um, a, a mode of governing, right? So, right. Uh, and a sort of technocratic, um, a, te a sort of technocratic politics without politics, if, if one might say. So, um, yeah, I definitely think that um, that they start seeing it also as, as um, they start see, I mean, the, 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 the sort of intrusion of electronics into, into more and more aspects of, of not just production, but of, of, of everyday life uh, in this period. Um, also, I mean, they were quite early to sort of see that that also had, um, I think, implications in terms of social control, right? As you also sort of uh, mentioned. And in fact, I think that's kind of, the, the two poles that the cybernetic hypothesis oscillates between, right, and which are also in Norbert Wiener's original title, which was right. communication and control in the animal and in the machine. So communication on the one hand, which sort of opens up for all these great spontaneous interactions, and then on the other hand, there's also the possibility of controlling uh, these interactions uh, to sort of fit a predetermined purpose, right? Uh, so, so I, I do definitely think that um, that's something that that happens, and that um, it's it's kind of a also a thesis of of of, of political uh, governance, very much. So, yeah. Does that um, sort yeah, of yeah? That's uh, yeah. Very uh, yeah. I have more to ask of, of you on, yeah. on that question, but I think we should probably move, uh, Toby. Um, if you have a yeah, another yeah I was I was briefly kicked out of the Zoom room and have just returned. Um, so clearly there's a glitch in the algorithmic governance of this call. <laughs> but uh, I guess based on what I am reconstructing from the last few scraps of dialogue I could hear, um, 
we haven't yet gotten to the question of how to formalize or theorize the avant-garde, and that's something that you just touched upon in your introductory comments, the notion that the SI was the last coherent attempt at uh, the avant-garde project, precisely because, and there's a part in the book where you, I think, very rigorously and um, dutifully reconstruct some of the debates around the definition of the avant-garde, and you lean, I think, appropriately on Berger's insistence that the avant-garde somehow challenged the institutions of art and also aimed to revolutionize life or to remake life. Um, and obviously those two goals are not identical, but are often mutually reinforcing. Um, but can you say a little bit more about the particular argument that your book makes about the situationist relation to previous avant-gardes, which may or may not be distinct from their own narrative about what they have or have not inherited from, say, the surrealists. So there's a kind of, I think that in every chapter, basically, you talk about either Dada or the surrealists or the constructivists. Um, so yeah, if you could just untangle that a little bit. Um, and I have a feeling that you will say something about how the specific effect of uh, cybernetics and its relation to the changing organic composition of capital somehow precipitated an alteration in the life that was being revolutionized. But just so that I'm a little bit clearer for myself, can you just talk about yeah, how your argument treats these kind of avant-garde inheritances. Yeah, I mean, um, of course, and, and I think you're you're absolutely right. I I I do sort of try to argue for the for the relevance of Peter Burger's theory of the avant-garde, and which to my mind is still, I mean, despite all of its um wants or all of its sort of um um gaps, uh, it, it's still really sort of the best way to approach this phenomenon of the avant-garde or the concept of the avant-garde. And if it, if it is to have any meaning beyond uh, merely uh, the most advanced um, uh, or what most formally sort of um, experimental art, it, it, I mean, then uh, I think we really do need to take these two things into account, the, the attack on the institution of art as such and uh, the 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 um, the ambition to sort of overthrow capitalist society um so and i think that if if those are the criteria that we sort of put to uh um put to the history of the 20th century avant-garde then, then i think that the si is is one of one of the few that actually sort of um would qualify as an avant-garde and of course that was also kind of their own narrative so i guess i'm i'm <laughs> I'm, I'm buying into that uh, I'm buying into that, um, but but um, then at the same time they were also one of the few um, groups or collectives that were actively um, recon trying to reconstruct the legacy the legacy of the interwar avant garde right who were um, going deep in the archives who had uh, uh, not not the, not just um, you know, superficial interest in these things from a formal perspective, but actually sort of try to understand what was at stake and, and when and how did, did art and politics come to sort of slide apart. Uh, so their claim was always that for, for all of these groups, from, from Dada through to Surrealism, even also in the Russian, or especially in the Russian, uh, sort of Russian Futurism, uh, Constructivism, and so on, uh, that they were all, that they, all that was what was sort of characteristic of all these different avant-garde interwar avant-garde groups was that they sort of insisted on keeping the artistic and the political close together, right? That these were never distinct projects. That, uh, and I mean, even in the reception of the SI, art historians really do, for some reason, want to um, uh, sort of divide these things and say, so there's a, an artistic and a political phase in the SI, or uh, one of them was sort of um, uh, more important than the other. And and I think that's really, um, that's really sort of a reductive understanding of what they were trying to do, because what they were trying to do was essentially sort of uh, reconstruct the, the, the unitary um, approach of, of the interwar avant-garde. Uh, and as I show in the book, uh, this involved also sort of uh, rehearsing and reformatting uh, 
sort of um, classical avant-garde tropes, such as the monochrome painting and um, the agit track to the manifesto form, um, even things like sculpture, constant sculpt sculptures, various by, by Russian constructivism. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I definitely think that, um, that um, the, 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 the European avant-garde legacy plays a huge role in the SI and um, that they were unique in, 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 in actively reconstructing that legacy and passing it on also and passing the importance of it on. I mean, mm -hmm. I think also that um, uh, a lot of art history, uh, a lot of sort of art historical approaches to the avant-garde, even to the interwar avant-garde, fails or falls short of, of understanding the radicality of them because they 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 keep insisting on sort of um, depoliticizing them, right? Um, so, yeah, I was very inspired. Can I ask another. Yeah, no, no, go on, go on. No, I I wanted to ask another um, a slightly nerdy follow up question about this because obviously within situationist historiography such as it is, there is some debate that maybe the b debate has already been settled. I might not be up to date exactly, but there's some debate about how to periodize the political and the artistic elements of the SI, and I think that the proper I think the the properly Marxist thing to do is to assert the the totality of the situationist practice and to insist fittingly on the unitary nature of it. I think you've made kind of the most comprehensive argument in this book for its unitary nature, but you also say that, um, and you can think of this as a transition from your first chapter to your second chapter, that uh, with the introduction of unitary urbanism, there is an emphasis on embracing objective historical developments and I was wondering, and I might be wrong about this, I was, I was wondering if, to a certain extent, your argument that situationist practice comprised a unitary whole that precisely sought to blur the distinction between art and politics, that in a sense, your argument, in a, it displaces or pushes that kind of break forward in history, or rather backward in history that the division is not between an artistic, artistic phase and a political phase, but between the lecturist international and the situationist international. I wasn't sure if that was something that you were getting at, and I think this may be too meta of a question, but it was interesting that uh, a lot of your book is about the ally and not necessarily the SI, which also brings me to another question about um, the, the beautifully anarchist decision to kind of decenter De Boer and your narrative here that you've in a sense decapitated or castrated the SI um, at least as far as uh, the SI is um, kind of received in the Anglophone world and you focus on figures who weren't exactly minor but are uh, definitely not the throbbing phallic center of what everyone thinks of as what the SI did or achieved um, but yeah I, I guess I had a, a slightly pointless um, historiographical question about um, whether or not you could re-narrate the shift from art to politics as really the shift from the ally to the SI, which always was kind of what De Boer himself said. Yeah, I mean, um, I think in a sense, um, uh, I mean, I think, you, uh, first of all, you're right. I mean, I do spend quite a, a, a good portion of the book um, discussing and sort of historicizing the ally, the Letrist International, which was kind of this um, um, precursor to the SI, right, and which consisted of many of the same people that would eventually go on to found the SI. So um, I think the reason that I do that is 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 because I really see the um, see the, the event in Marseille that I discuss in my first chapter as the sort of founding moment of this, um, of the kind of ideas, like it's all all in place there basically, right? So and uh, so whether they called themselves the Letras International or the Situations International, I think was less important. Um, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I try to push it back a little bit from 1957 to 1956 uh and um but uh whether or not that um, yeah i'm not sure if that uh is significant to 
my sort of periodization um, in terms of the sort of transition from an artistic to a political phase, since I kind of reject that idea, right? Um, mm -hmm. So um, I, by contrast, I think I try to show how these things were even in, even in its, I mean, chapter two is about what, what is sometimes referred to as the architectural interlude. I think that's Tom McDonough's term, um, which is kind of a good term because they were really obsessing at, at this point over um, urbanism and architecture and um, things like that. So, I mean, and that maybe if that was the situationists uh, in their sort of um, most artistic phase, then even at that point, as I try to show, they they were really sort of um, the, the, the distinction between them and someone like Le Corbusier and, and other sort of French architects or urbanists was really sort of the difference between uh, the, the total work of art as, a, as something that would sort of facilitate um, uh, capitalist production and, and a sort of experimental creating of situations that would sort of counter it right so so their conception of urbanism and uh really sort of runs counter to uh the kind of sort of urban planning schemes of the post-war period so there's like even though there's like quite a lot of sort of overlaps there's really an, an important distinction to be made i think um uh, yeah precisely because of their sort of politics, right? The, the sort of the, the commitment to to overthrowing um, the capitalist sort of um, fashioning of space and, and urban space and the, the, the partitioning of it into sort of uh, um, different sort of ghettoized compartments, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have always argued or always thought that if you if you took into consideration filmic production, cinematic production in the context of the SI, the whole sort of 57 to 62 is the artistic SI. And then after that, it's politics. I feel like that that makes it harder to sort of settle on that, mm -hmm. that uh, periodization. But I, I want to go back to the avant-garde question that was you guys were talking about just a second ago, because I think this is an important um, sort of thread in the book, um, obviously. And um, in particular, one of the things that struck me about your, your analysis or your account, or one of the things that you make clear is that one of the key sort of continuities between the French version of the avant-garde, um, i.e. the Surrealists in particular, and the SI was the sort of commitment to anti-colonial struggles. And it's very much a, a kind of a key core aspect of the early 20s Surrealists and, and certainly the, the SI as well. Um, and um, this is important to me in, in some sense, because in the context of the book, you, you know, 1956 is like kind of this origin point for you. Of course, that's a very key moment because, of course, the Algerian war, on the one hand, is kind of raging um, and the French left has, is a, has a totally deplorable position, whether they, the socialists in particular, but the PCF had a very ambiguous uh, stance on on the war um, in Algeria. Um, but the PCF more generally had uh, was undergoing this kind of sort of um, systemic crisis, if you like insofar as, of course, the, the the question of Stalin's crimes and so on and so forth was a kind of key uh, sort of um, uh, event of the sort of 56 um, communist international um, sort of uh, uh, self-examination. Um, uh, but there's also this, you know, this larger crisis of communism, which you describe in the book, um, that is in some sense, not merely um, a kind of political crisis, let's say the history of the legacy of Stalinism or the failure to address anti-colonial struggles in a, in a, in a um, way that foregrounds human emancipation rather than the role of the French state and so on and so forth. Um, but there's this question of the crisis of Marxism understood from the perspective of, in some sense, a crisis of the labor movement, right? There's a sense in which the labor movement which was this kind of uh, antagonistic pole within this sort of capitalist society um, up to the Second World War and maybe into the 50s had increasingly become kind of integrated into the kind of dynamics of capitalist society and, and, the, and uh, at the political level, the governance of that society, right? The inclusion of the communists in various kind of marginal ways within French uh, state and so on and so forth. 
So I was wondering in a long, <laughs> in a kind of long winded detour, if you could talk a little bit about how this crisis of Marxism in the 50s affects that equation of art and politics, that kind of avant-garde equation of art and politics, right? Because the Surrealists could just sort of throw themselves in the service of the revolution, right? Because the PCF was this kind of beacon. This It was the representative of the class struggle and, and so on and so forth. Had an international dimension in, insofar as it was part of the communist international. But that was not a, available to the avant-garde, you could say, in the, in the mid 50s. And in some sense, the SI's own trajectory is shaped by that, it seems to me. Um, by that that kind of uh, crisis. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or if, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of sum su summarizing and synthesizing things from your book, but if you have thoughts on that or if that seems like a relevant way of thinking about um, what the SI was as an avant-garde formation. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, I think that, um, so I think that French, I mean, my, my book, I should say, is very sort of centered in, in sort of, Central Europe and in France in particular. Um, so there's maybe a little bit of a, a um, French bias, uh, but I, um, one of the things that kind of structure this moment, I think in, in, in French politics is, and not just in French politics, but maybe it's sort of um, symptomatic of, of the broader sort of, um, I should say crisis of Marxism, sort of the new, the emergence of the new left and the sort of, um, realization that um you know maybe um russia wasn't so great after all um but um so i think that on the one hand we have like um the french communist party the pcf which is kind of uh officially part of the sort of um um uh, eastern bloc right or sort of supports it and uh and then on the other hand we have like the french ultra left and sort of different post uh, Trotskyist fractions and, and groups and sects and uh, Socialismo Bavari would be like one of the main examples of, of this, right? Um, and they uh, really sort of wavered in their in their sort of um, um, political commitments at this point, right? And I think so. I think that the SI stands somewhere in between, like they, they realized that they couldn't make the same mistake as the surrealists had done and just sort of, as you say, put themselves in the service of the revolution or sort of get a membership card for the party. Uh, so that was not an option. Uh, and on the other hand, they also kind of rejected this, the, the sort of Trotskyist, um, the sort of Trotskyist um, ideas. So I think that they were kind of unique uh in that and and part of their sort of um part of the interest as for us as sort of marxists or leftists or whatever in in sort of rediscovering this legacy is also in rediscovering a kind of marxism that uh that does not really fit into um you know the established narrative of the new left or into the sort of like more orthodox marxist accounts right and i think that um precisely their um their sort of um, surreal, surrealist sort of um, legacy allows them to sort of formulate different alternatives. Precisely also on the matter of, of um, colonialism, they were really sort of um, indebted, indebted, I think, to, to the sort of surrealist anti-colonial struggles reaching back to like the Mor Moroccan war mm -hmm. uh, and their opposition to that. And, um, and um, they were very vocal about um, France's complicity in the genocide in Algeria during the Algerian war. So I think uh, that allowed them also to sort of um, have some, some political analyses that were quite original. I mean, their texts on uh, the Algerian question uh, and um, the analysis of, of, of the um, coup of Ben Bella's regime in Algeria in 65 and so on. I mean, they, they really, uh, also the, the text, Two Local Wars, which is, I think, more relevant than ever, which discusses uh, the Vietnam War in relation to the, the, the 1967 war in, in Israel, Palestine. So, I mean, uh, really a lot of, of really, really interesting overlooked perspectives that I really regret not going into more depth in uh in my book i i mean um 
I think um, that could be an entire book in itself because it's really um, another <laughs> another overlooked dimension. I mean, I've tried to sort of pull this one out, but there's still work work to be done, I think, uh, from this perspective. Um, I'm not sure if I went on a rant here that had nothing to do with what you asked me. No, that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah. And, and thank you both for bringing up the anti-colonial aspect, which I think is a really important part of what this book accomplishes, is that it um, uh, it, it, it threads through a commitment to internationalism that is actually not especially shared, I think, by a lot of uh, pro-situ acolytes of the situation is that they are actually far less provincial than a lot of their subsequent fetishists. Sorry, I'm not even trying to be polemical, but that simply is the case. That said, I think that there are still a few unresolved contradictions, as is the case with any political position or post-political position, um, that I'm I'm not sure if it's fair to demand that you answer for the SI in a sense, but I kept on thinking, especially uh, considering the, the really bold and comprehensive arguments that your book makes about how to properly think through the situationist's relation to processes of racialization, which is not a key term for them. It's not one of their many neologisms, and it's not properly at the forefront of their analysis. And yet it almost is, because as we see in the writings on the Watts Rebellion, on Mustafa Hayati's writings, especially uh, about the revolution in the underdeveloped countries, the fact that, the, first of all, it's called, the Constance Project is called New Babylon, and he also does the project for a gypsy camp. And again, it's uh, a, a way of conceiving of this brave new world that somehow has this bizarre continuity with the production of surplus populations, but also with primitive accumulation, that everywhere you turn, there seems to be some relation to uh, a, a world just outside the frame of the supposedly futuristic cybernetic future. And something that I just had a question about maybe for uh, further investigation or further research is how do you relate the cybernetic hypothesis, which you so convincingly argue was the implicit kind of problematic within which a lot of situationist concepts were developed. But the cybernetic hypothesis was a relatively provincial discourse. It had dreams of international reach and dreams of totalization. But ultimately, uh, I was wondering if you could map the cybernetic hypothesis as the situation is engaged with it onto a world that the situation is divided between concentrated and diffuse spectacular power. I mean, the Hayati text from, I think it's 1967, on the revolution in the underdeveloped countries. I mean, basically Hayati says, there aren't even really proper socialist or national liberation movements happening in the third world. These are peasant bureaucratic revolutions that have barely even managed to accumulate capital. They're mostly accumulating lies. And he ends the article, wait, I think I have it pulled up somewhere. He ends the article by saying, I mean, he does a detournement of Marx and he says, so far the revolutions in the underdeveloped countries have only tried to imitate Bolshevism in various ways. From now on, the point is to go beyond it through the power of the Soviets. So we have a kind of return to the classic call for all power to the workers' councils. But again, it's being mapped onto a political environment that, on the one hand, is totally continuous with the SI's preoccupation with anti-colonialism, and yet is a little bit more difficult to integrate into their worldview and is also difficult to integrate into their preoccupation with the cybernetic hypothesis and all this stuff. Um, I'm not sure if it's even fair to ask you to even respond to that kind of garbled mash of language, but I kept on feeling like uh, one of the arguments that the book was making kept on being spat out into this antinomy that weirdly seems central to the SI itself. What do you do with the masses of people uh, who experience concentrated spectacular power? Um, and I guess you could argue that by the end of his career and comments on the society of spectacle, that the integrated spectacle somehow bridges the gap between these two. Um, but I was just wondering if you had any, any comments on that. Also, because as you, I think, really compellingly claim in the book, 
I mean, for Debord, it was so important that this new revolution would not simply be a revolution on uh, in the mode of production, but also on the level of values. That, of course, um, once your scale or the arena of your conflict is everyday life, that one of your tasks is the philosophical task of creating new values, new ways of living, which implies an entire philosophical anthropology and a new definition of man, whether it's homo ludens, or, I mean, whatever. And I was like, yeah, well, th that is in a sense, also, at least partly, the Fanonian tasks. Their withering critiques of Fanonism notwithstanding, um, I kept on trying to somehow make the two philosophies, which are entirely contemporaneous, or mostly contemporaneous, closer together in my mind. And I was just wondering if you had any stray thoughts about that. I would be really grateful, but I recognize um, what I've just said is almost a little bit uh, like too big to really address head on. No, no, not at all. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I, yeah, like I, I'm pretty sure I don't have um, a, a very convincing sort of response to that or like it's definitely something that I'd love to write another book about. <laughs> but um, but as you say, I mean, <clears throat> they were, the SI were, um, I wouldn't say dismissive, but very critical of sort of the national liberation movements uh, and um, for being sort of reactionary, right? And sort of attached to religion and um, um, it's like Pan-African or Pan-Arabic or whatever um, the case might be, um, ideas that that they saw as kind of like holding back the potential of the people themselves to, to, to liberate uh, to liberate themselves. Um, so, um, so I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how that relates to sort of um, the idea of, of, of the cybernetic hypothesis, but maybe to return to your first question, I mean, that was very much kind of their critique of Ben Bella's regime mm -hmm. was that he sort of, uh, he's, it was like a nominally, nominally socialist regime that sort of, um, appeared or, or claimed to um, to want workers self-management of society, right? When in reality, uh, like they say in um, in one of the texts, uh, when when after the coup in 65, uh, Boumediene makes clear that um, what Ben Bella was, he was just sort of drawing the consequences of Ben Bella's own sort of um, mistakes, right? That, so that's kind of, um, uh, why they were critical was because that um, a lot of these sort of nominally socialist um, governments that were reinstated in the wake of sort of um, revolutions and, and independence wars around the in, the in the form of colonies, a lot of these um, uh, governments, provisionary governments or whatever, were very often sort of uh, falling back upon. Um, uh, as you said, like Bolshevik models of organization, right? And and as opposed to that, they they would say they would sort of put this ideal of of the workers' councils and actual sort of self management, right? Which was um, maybe um, a kind of cybernetically inflicted imagining of of social organization without without central command. Um, so I, I do think there's uh, some connection between those things but on the other hand there's also just maybe simply the fact that um that for all their attention to to uh colonialism and anti-colonialism um there's also simply just um like uh maybe like a european bias and they're sort of i mean they had they also operated with this term that i think is um potentially problematic, the colonization of everyday life, right? So how um, life within the sort of, within metropolitan France, in this case, or in the US for that matter, uh, sort of mirrored and folded, and sort of colonization sort of folded back into to the structuring of everyday life. Um, and I mean, I, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, things to be said in favor of that hypothesis, uh, especially sort of the seg segregation of space uh, of urban space uh, and um, different sort of methods of control, uh, zones of visitation, and so on. But um, but it's 
it's maybe partly also an under theorized aspect, especially when it comes to these more um, utopian uh, ideas, right? Like, um, so the SI at their most utopian imagines a kind of like undifferentiated, I think, um, future uh, where technology would sort of equally liberate all, right? And in that respect, I think they share um, a lot of naivete with, with their um, supposed uh, enemies, uh, <laughs> the cyberneticists, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of, I mean, and the Watts text is still, I think, uh, in my opinion, a really great text for the time. I mean, when it mm -hmm. was written, it was kind of unheard of to defend uh, looting, right, as, as, a, as a sort of concept and, and, and practice. So I think the, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, th I, I think there's, um, this is definitely an under theorized aspect of the SI and I, I wish I would have sort of gone into more detail with it. Um, I'd really love to see um, some more work on that. And I'll just add, I think one of the more poignant aspects of the encounter between national liberation struggles or rather anti-colonialism and the SI is that, of course, as you know, the person who wrote those lines about all hitherto revolutions have only tried to Bolshevism in various ways. I mean, the person who wrote the critique of Fanon, uh, the critique of Maoism, the critique of third worldism, the critique of national liberation, the critique of Guevarism, a few years after he writes those words, he resigns from the Situationist International and joins the Maoist split of the PFLP, the DFLP. So essentially he becomes a Fanonist, Guevarist, uh, national liberationist for a brief period. And I mean, somehow the trajectory of that career seems to mark the outer limit of what the SI could actually conceive of. Um, but again, I don't want to allegorize Hayati's particular political trajectory, but I do think it is kind of amazing that the person who authored The Poverty of Student Life also ended up becoming a guerrilla and going to a guerrilla training camp and wanting to fight for Palestine. Anyway, also... I think yeah. topical. Definitely. Are we? Uh, I don't know where we are in time. Um, oh, you can, you can, we can do a few more. That's fine. Okay. I just, I, you know, I have one last question. I think. I, I mean, I'll restrict it to one last question. And I should say, just as a general kind of um, marginal comment on uh, the the exchange, is that one of the things I really like about the book is that you know, unlike a lot of the at least up to now, like the treatment of the SI is typically kind of hagiographical, you know, it's a kind of celebration of the, the sort of great men of the, you know, the mid, mid 20th century or whatever the um, vision is. And I think that one of the things that is interesting about the SI, particularly the way you treat them, is that, you know, in some sense as a group or as a formation of some sort, they sort of concentrate all these different kinds of contradictions of their own time. And that kind of articulates itself in various kinds of uh, tendencies within the group and, and so on and so forth, sometimes quite clear contradictions, you know, in a kind of very uh, basic level. And I think that you, you know, in many cases, you do a, um, a kind of admirable job of sort of um, spelling out those contradictions within the kind of um, position and the trajectory of the SI. Um, but I wanted to ask a little bit about Asker Yorn because Asker Yorn does, it's, as you mentioned, I think in the introduction, Asker Yorn plays a, a kind of key role in your book. And, I, and maybe you could talk a little bit about how Asker Yorn, how you address Yorn's place in the SI, but also how you, um, how you sort of revise, as you characterize it to me, the kind of, you know, Yorn scholarship, uh, which tends, at least in certain contexts, to um, bracket or or um, place in the margins his his role in, in the SI. And I think maybe also just as a, a kind of final note, I mean, you have a kind of very interesting reading of, of Yorn as a kind of theorist as much as a, a, a kind of artist, uh, visual artist. And in particular, I kind of, he has a kind of reading of Marx, which you characterized as, uh, I think, something like proto value form or something like that reading. And, the, and this is from the, I think, the late 50s or early 60s. So maybe just in general, if you could talk about how like maybe strategically, Yorn plays a role in your account of the SI and and how, what kind of intervention you're making in various, you know, disciplines or whatever um, uh, in doing so, in sort of placing him so uh, front and center. Yeah, uh, uh, I'd be happy to, <laughs> to elaborate on that. Um, and I think it also ties into what Toby said about 
sort of decentering the bar, right? Right. Um, because apart from uh, the bar, I think that one could could um, claim as as I do that um, one of one of the most important figures in the history of DSI was was Aska Jorn. Uh, and again, um, that might also have a little bit to do with my own sort of particular um, biography, because <laughs> I grew up in in Denmark, as some of you may know, and um, to a to a French father and a Danish mother. But uh, so I had sort of um, first hand access to a lot of these um, discussions about Jon. He's a really important figure and sort of in in Danish culture and 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 really well known like perhaps the most well known uh danish artist uh every time there's like an anniversary or something uh you know like all the museums and and the newspapers and so on are just like going nuts about yon he has his own museum uh there's a there's an archive that i've been to uh quite a few times for this book uh, which also holds substantial um archives of the situationist movement so um so yeah, that's just to say that I I um I'm invested in in Jan uh for particular reasons, but but also for reasons of his 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 sort of overlooked centrality to the project, and I, and I think that coming back to the, the the art and politics divide, part of the reason why Jan um Jan's role has sort of been um uh, under acknowledged is because he he stepped out of the movement officially right uh, in the beginning of the 60s and but but kept contributing financially and intellectually um, to the movement and kept a close correspondence with with the board throughout his life so um all of this just to say that um what i found uh in the archives and um it was that young was was uh though he's often just portrayed at this as this um Painter, right? As this artist, as T.J. Clark calls him, the greatest painter of the 1950s, um, he was actually also deeply involved in the sort of intellectual work that 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 um, is often attributed solely to to De Boer. Uh, and um, in particular, he was he was very sort of um, interested in the question of automation. And as I argue, many of these. Um, shorter uh, key texts on automation were actually authored by Jan and edited by De Boer. Uh, and um, so, yeah, he, he was really sort of key to articulating some of these central concerns within the movement. Um, yeah, and I think that um, that kind of goes against the grain a little bit of, of how Jan has been received, not just in Denmark, but in the sort of international scholarship as well. Which which kind of tend to sort of um, bracket um, Jon's uh, intellectual sort of contribution. Uh, I mean, there is great scholarship on Jon. Karen Kuczynski should be mentioned here. Her book, uh, "The Art and Politics of Asking Jon," I believe it's called, is really noteworthy. And um, uh, so there is good scholarship on Jon. I just feel that it needs to um, be updated, um, maybe in light of of some of the things that I uh, discuss in the book. Um, yeah, so I'm hoping uh, if there's any Jan scholars listening, I'm really hoping that uh, someone will engage my argument, engage with my arguments. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see someone brought up uh, um, Karen Kuczynski's book in the comments. Uh, Toby and Jason, any any thoughts, any closing ideas before we go into Q and A? Toby, I have tons of thoughts, but I don't think that it's really worth <laughs> kind of trying to compress them um, for for the sake of conclusion. Uh, there are a few things that maybe will come up in the Q and A, or that we can point to in the Q and A that I wanted to talk about that we didn't get to talk about, which is. Le Corbusier and the boycott order. Um, so if that happens to be opposite, uh, given some of the questions that we get, um, then it'd be cool to talk about that. But I think it's, it's I, I've, I've asked mostly what I wanna ask. Jason, your turn. Yeah, and I'll just say that uh, one of the things I'm really interested in, um, and this was alluded to briefly in 
uh, Dominique's um, introduction is the kind of contemporary discourse around automation and the way this book in a slightly oblique way sort of functions as a kind of intervention within that discourse. It's, I, I noted that um, when I was rereading it uh, this morning or looking back over my notes this morning, that it's typically the very last line or the very last paragraph of a chapter where you'll quickly kind of fast forward into the present and kind of sometimes um, indirectly refer to this or that sort of uh, left automation theorist typically uh, in a kind of critical way. And I think that's kind of um, one of the interesting aspects of the book that we could talk about maybe the Q and A or it's worth, I think people considering that uh, when they're reading the book, so. Thank you. Cool. So I'll go into some of the comments now. <clears throat> Leslie says, um, in spite of the fact that we're all laboring under the silicon heel now, I think that the so-called AI tools like DALI can enable a lot more Asker Jorns in the world, sending up any images of political power like global street art. Uh, it is sad that so many political groups no longer seem to care for or respect a working class. And many of us middle class folks are headed in that direction, um, et cetera. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, also, Leslie says, not to deflect from Dominique's book, but an interesting book may be The Art and Politics of Asker Jorn, The Avant Garde Won't Give Up uh, by Karen Krasinski. Let's see. Uh, Robin uh, says, a basic question. I would be very curious to hear about the place, if any, of Gilbert Simondon in the SI's engagements with cybernetics. So could um, the first question from, uh, who was that from? Uh, so that was from, uh, let's see, Leslie, I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> Perhaps um, Leslie would like to maybe restate the question. Um, well, if I can find Leslie, um, hold on, maybe. Why don't we just unmute Leslie and just have Leslie ask the question? Leslie, I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Can you hear us? Leslie, can you hear us? I think Leslie's microphone is not working. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's just not happening, I guess. Uh, it was also more of a comment, so I think. Yeah, it was more of a comment. So, uh, okay, so maybe uh, why don't I just um, maybe try to respond. <laughs> Leslie says she has no mic and I can't, I have no mic and I cannot. Yeah, stand. okay. <laughs> that explains it. <laughs> Sorry, Leslie. Um, the place of uh, Gilbert Simonton and the SI's engagement with cybernetics. Um, I mean, obviously, um, Simonton was very, um, very important and for this sort of reception of cybernetics in France and its um, philosophical um, philosophical interpretation, but um, he didn't play uh, any particular role for the SI. Um, they were much more concerned with the figures, the cyberneticists that in one way or another um, sort of interfered with or um, uh, participated in the these sort of art discussions at the time. So uh, much more important than Simon Don was someone like um, Abraham Moll, who we already mentioned, and uh, some of the artists like Nicolas Schiffer and, um, and others. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure there might be, um, there might have been something that I'm not aware of, but um, as far as I could tell, uh, Simon Don doesn't really play a, a huge role for DSI. 
though uh, I mean his work is interest very interesting. Robin says that's very helpful. They were just curious. Thank you. Any other questions, folks, before we wrap? Doesn't seem to be. Gentlemen, any final thoughts before we go? Well, I would just like to encourage people uh, to, you know, read the book. It's a fantastic book. And uh, I spent a little bit of time with it. And I've been thinking about it a lot uh, over the last, uh, I don't know, month or so. And so I think it's really a kind of uh, important intervention. And I think that um, it's kind of a welcome contribution to the discourse, not all the SI, on the SI, let's say for people who are art historians or art theorists or artists or, or, or people involved in art, but also for people interested in, in what the subtitle calls the age of automation, this kind of historical epoch, which is sort of redefined in kind of new terms, it seems to me by the book. And I think it's a, it, of interest whether or not you place the emphasis on the title or the subtitle, I suppose. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I would say is I would really encourage people to um, to read the book and, and sort of uh, think the this moment and this formation uh, with it. Thank you, Jason. I second uh, that. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, I just also want to um, express my, my gratitude to all of you uh, for um, showing up tonight, and um, especially um, you, Toby, for for for. Um, <laughs> I think it's a, it's late where you are. Um, I like so. to think of it as early where I am. <laughs> early, okay, yeah. With and against. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, we got one last last little comment here. If I can throw that in from RJ, uh, there was okay. a tweet. There was a tweet a few years ago that went. If you're not a situationist in your 20s, you have no heart. If you're not a crisis theorist in your 30s, you have no brain. I'm looking forward to reading the book. <laughs> but gentlemen, uh, to the three of you, thanks so much for this compelling discussion. Dominic, congratulations, and, and thank you for producing this really excellent addition to, I mean, not just the library of situationist writings, but as, as Toby was saying, um, you know, anti-colonial studies too. Um, and thanks for staying up at such a late hour. Um, this does not get lost on us. Toby Haslett, Jason E. Smith, thank you both for gracing our virtual halls. And we hope to see you again at some point, maybe with your own writings. Um, really grateful to you for that. And thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us. You help complete the circle as always. Tonight's program has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So goodbye, everyone. Take care. Hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.